Our scripture readings this morning uh, will be a few verses from Genesis 12 and then a few verses from Hebrews 11. So from uh, Genesis chapter 12, and uh, this uh, chapter is uh, detailing the call of God uh, to Abraham. The word of the Lord from Genesis 12, beginning with verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And then uh, from Hebrews uh, chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 is uh, commonly called and popularly called the um, heroes of the faith. So uh, Hebrews 11, uh, beginning with verse 8, is about Abraham, one of the heroes of the faith. The word of the Lord from Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went on to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. By faith, okay, so uh, I'll go to verse 13, the word of the Lord. This all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. That's why the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal, and merciful God, whose word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, open and illumine our minds, that we may purely and perfectly understand your word, and that our lives may be conformed according to what we rightly understood, that in nothing we may be displeasing unto your majesty, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dear Congregation of Christ, so this is the third sermon in a 12-point, 12 12-part uh, 12 series that I'm preaching about the biblical, theological, and historical aspects of the church. In this series, I would also expound on the different names that the Holy Scriptures use, uh, use for the church, such as the redeemed of Israel, Zion, vineyard of the Lord, temple of the Lord, his flock, and the bride of church, uh, the bride of Christ. And uh, we will be dealing with those names in the next uh, sermons. So the first in the series, as you, you remember, was the church gardeners and guardians. So an exposition of the Garden of Eden as God's temple 
and Adam and Eve as the first church. God commanded them to work and keep the garden as his stewards. So they were to work the garden to prosper it and guard the garden from evil, which they failed to do when they did not drive Satan out of the garden. The second in the series, the church, shipbuilders, and life savers, uh, life savers, a study of Noah and his family as the church, and the ark that saved the church is Christ, the type of Christ. The church has always built arks or ships of Christ that save the lives of unbelievers. So today, we will meditate on the church, of foreigners desiring a better country, where we will focus on the life of Abraham, Sarah, and Lot as foreigners, strangers, and pilgrims on this earth desiring to be citizens of a better country, the heavenly city whose designer is God and built on the foundation of his word. So this is our theme, this Lord's Day, the church, part three, foreigners desiring a better country on uh, under two headings. So the first is the church, foreigners on earth. So God first called Abraham in Genesis 12, 1. So back in Genesis 11, Abraham's father Terah and his family left Ur of the Chaldeans uh, in present-day southern Iraq to go to Canaan, and that was about a thousand miles to the west. From archaeological findings, Ur was a city of great wealth, craftsmanship, and technology. But for reasons unknown, uh, Terah settled in the city of Haran, 600 miles north in present-day Turkey, and he did not make it to Canaan. But we know from um, Stephen's speech before the Jewish high court that God commanded Abraham to go to an unknown land while he was still in Ur. Uh, he said about uh, this in Acts 7 verse 2, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. So without any complaint or argument, Abraham left his father's family and country. So Genesis 12 verse 4 simply says, So Abraham went as the Lord told him. So he was already 75 years old by that time. And Sarah, his wife, was already 66. And verse 8 says, He went not knowing where he was going. Abraham believed God's promises in Genesis 12, the first three verses. So there were two main pro uh, promises. The first is, uh, was, I will make you a great nation. But the preacher in Hebrew says there was a problem with both of them. Abraham, he says, was as good as dead and Sarah was past the age. But Abraham and Sarah, though after 11 years had doubted God's promises, still believed God, that God would give them descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. And then the second promise is this, all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In Galatians 3.16, Paul says that the promises were made to Abraham and his descendants through Christ, in whom multitudes from all nations became Abraham's children, heirs of the promises made to him. Galatians 3.29, all Jews and Gentiles like us are Abraham's children, through faith in Christ alone as Savior. Another part of the promise to Abraham is that all peoples would be blessed through him. This is promise 
has everything to do with the church, God's people today, and not with Israel. Christians will bless other Christians, and unbelievers will be enemies of believers. When Abraham reached Canaan, what did he do? Verse 9 of our text says, By faith, Abraham went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Jacob, Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. It was hard enough for his household to leave the wealthy cities of Ur and Haran. It was even harder to settle in a foreign land by living in tents. This is as you traveled all the way from Big Springs down south to Tierra del Fuego in Chile, practically the bottom of the earth, in a camper. But when you get there, you live in the same camper for the rest of your life. That's what Abraham did. Why did Abraham do this to his family? The writer tells us in verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And the only real estate that Abraham owned is in his life was Sarah's tomb, a cave near Hebron. So though he lived in the land of Canaan, he lived in tents with his family. He lived a different life from his neighbors. He worshiped one God, the creator in heaven, not many man-made gods that his neighbors worshiped. His life was based on God's law, not man-made laws. His life was a life that Paul calls non-conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of his mind through the Spirit. He was a foreigner, an alien, a stranger, a sojourner, an exile, and a pilgrim through this barren land, a land where God does not pour out his spiritual blessings except to Abraham and his household. As Christians, we too are foreigners, aliens, strangers, exiles, sojourners, and pilgrims, while we are still in this earthly dwelling place. In this world, we are surrounded by all kinds of ungodly people who are apathetic to God, at least, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the scriptures, if not, hate them outright. When Abraham made his pilgrimage from Ur to Canaan, the church then was made up of himself, his wife Sarai, and his nephew Lot, and his household. During their sojourn in Canaan, their lives were marred by opposition from the sinful world. Twice, powerful men, the Pharaoh of Egypt and Abimelech, king of Gerar, had sinful desires for Sarah. So Abraham was forced to tell a half lie that she was his sister. Of course, this is half truth since she was his half sister. Then the men of Sodom wanted to break down the door of Lot's house to commit sexual immorality with the men visiting Lot. Faithful churches today are surrounded by a culture that the 60s sexual revolutionaries would be embarrassed about and could not have even conceived today's sexual culture. Worse, many so-called progressive churches have embraced LGBTQ, transgenderism, and drag queen shows. Evil men and culture surrounding us is not the only cause of troubles in the church. Troubles can also come from our own 
sinful selves. How did Lot end up in Sodom? It was all about water rights and gazing, uh, grazing rights. Both Abraham and Lot had great flocks and herds that the land could not support both of them. And so they parted ways. Abraham gave Lot the first choice and Lot's mindset was earthly. He chose the land close to the cities, particularly the city of Sodom, even when he most likely knew that according to Genesis 13, 13, the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Lot was overcome by the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions. In our context today, city life has more appeal to Lot than country life. San Francisco is the financial and cultural center of Northern California with its banks and jobs, theaters, museums, major sports, and exciting nightlife. Never mind the ultra-liberal, woke, progressive, and sexually perverted culture coupled with homelessness all over the city. As believers and as a church, especially us small church in Big Springs, we must guard against these material desires and pride. We might not have a big, beautiful worship building full of people, but God does not regard outward appearances and numbers. He regards these things, hearts and minds that are always thankful and joyful in all circumstances, that long for the pure word of God preached and taught by faithful ministers, that worship according to God's word alone, and that are united not in a skillful, eloquent minister, but in one body and one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Lot's wife illustrates the tragedy of not being able to unload oneself of material desires and pride. We all know what happened to her after they escaped Sodom. An incident, another incident in the life of Abraham has a striking parallel to the most major event in the Garden of Eden. So after the serpent tempted Adam, uh, Eve, Eve gave the forbidden fruit to Adam. So he also ate the fruit. When God confronted them, the age old blame shifting started. Adam blamed Eve for giving the fruit to him, and Eve blamed the serpent. In the case of Abraham, Sarah offered her servant Hagar to him so she could bear a son for him. And Abraham willingly accepted her offer without any question. After Ishmael was born to Hagar, and Hagar had contempt for Sarah, because Sarah was barren, Sarah blamed Abraham for her troubles. So like Adam and Eve, both Abraham and Sarah had sinned. Abraham, it says in Genesis 16:2, listened to the voice of Sarah. And Adam, in effect, also listened to Eve's sinful offer. Both of them took God's promise into their own hands, doubted God's promises, and instead listened to their sinful hearts. Abraham and Sarah's doubting hearts had a disastrous consequence. That of Hagar's descendants continuing their hostility against Abraham's descendants until this very day. These two incidents characterize 
the church from the very beginning. Troubles arise often from inside the church too, not only from outside. False teachers, false prophets, and heretics have been around in Old Covenant Israel and the New Covenant Church. The early church from the first six or seven centuries was beset by heretical teachings so that many councils were called and creeds were written to prevent divisions. This situation is still with the church today. Many in the church listen to the voice of false teachers who have one hand in on the Bible and the other hand on his jet or yacht or Lamborghini. Both uh, the troubles in the church does not end in false teachers. Many in the church listen to ministers who divide the church because of, for example, their heavy-handed leadership, bad decisions resulting from unwise counsel, and preaching from the internet. Some church bloggers even recommend using AI, artificial intelligence, to help pastors in sermon preparation. One writer tested it by uploading John chapter 4 into an AI app, and in less than 10 seconds, it came up with a homily of 352 words. This technology is scary for our already mindless culture. For example, how would a teacher assign a report to an elementary class or a research paper to college students? Would the teacher trust that the report or paper was actually written by the students or by AI? In the church, how would the congregation trust that sermons were actually prepared by the pastor and not by AI? This is a difficult and dangerous technology. So that an article in Christianity Today concluded, and I quote, a chat bot, you know, like a AI, a chat bot can research, a chat bot can write, Perhaps a chat bot can even orate, but a chat bot cannot preach. A chat bot cannot preach. However, even when Abraham doubted God's promise with its dire consequences, he was a faithful and obedient man of God all the way to the end. He fought against the sinful culture surrounding him because he was looking forward to the heavenly country. We too must be countercultural in the world, but not of the world. He was truly set apart by God to be holy and righteous, different from the godless world around us. May we reflect this set apartness by our mindset and behavior among our unbelieving neighbors. So they too would ask why we think and behave so differently from them. The church then and now is God's chosen people who live on this earth, surrounded by a sinful, godless world and culture and desiring, but desiring to live in an eternal, better country. So secondly, firstly, uh, the church, foreigners in uh, desiring a better country, and then the church, citizens of heaven. Abraham obeyed because of God's promise of a land, but ultimately his, his gaze was heavenward. He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And his desire was a better country, 
that is a heavenly one. The heavenly city is the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21. Its foundations are the teachings of the 12 apostles of Christ and his prophets. Revelation 21, 14 and Ephesians 2, 20. But the main foundation is Christ himself, the chief cornerstone of the church. As the hymn says, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is the only designer and builder of the church. He is at the same time the architect, the engineer, and building contractor of the church. If God is not the foundation, designer, and builder of a church, then it is not a church. Although we are citizens of our earthly countries, we desire and look forward to a better citizenship in a better country where we will all dwell with God forever. And what makes the heavenly city a far better country? Our Lord Jesus Christ. He is its better mediator of a better covenant. He is the better high priest, the great high priest of a better temple. He speaks a better and perfect word than all the prophets of the Old Testament. Christ is the eternal, pure, and perfect king of this better country. And this country is better because there will be no night there, because the glory of God and Christ will shine on it forever. Finally, it has a better temple because our Lord Jesus Christ is the temple himself. The heavenly city is an unimaginably better country. All people in this country will be of one faith, one Lord, one mind, and all will be in perfect communion with God and with one another. No more conflicts within God's people, no more sufferings, no more persecution, no more death, no more living in tents and campers. There we would have arrived, no longer aliens, strangers, sojourners and pilgrims, but full-fledged citizens of heaven. Like Abraham, all true believers must look forward to their final home, God's holy heavenly city. God calls us to live like Abraham did in our earthly pilgrimage, but our ultimate gaze must always be our eternal residence, the heavenly city. Though we live in our own homes and own cars and other earthly possessions, we must acknowledge that all of these are temporary. They are passing away. We are dual citizens, citizens of heaven first and citizens of our nation second. As you think about your life as pilgrims through this barren land, Colossians 3, 1 to 2 exhorts us, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. We are too often occupied and too focused on the cares, thorns, and thistles of our earthly existence. Rather, we are to look heavenward because everything on earth will be of no value in the end. Only things that are above matters in eternity. In a great reversal, every Lord's Day worship service like this, we are transformed from earthly pilgrims to heavenly citizens. In this great reversal, unbelieving citizens of the world become the foreigners, aliens, and strangers, because they are outside of the heavenly city, while we who worship the true God 
are changed into permanent citizens of a better, holy, and heavenly country. Dear brothers and sisters, Peter says that we Christians are sojourners and exiles in this world. We are temporary residents of this world and exiles in a foreign country. But we must still fully participate in the civil, social, and cultural life of our cities and nations. We know that we have no enduring earthly city, but are citizens of heaven. Therefore, we are, as I said, dual citizens of two kingdoms. We are citizens of the earthly kingdom of men and citizens of the heavenly city or kingdom of God. But our ultimate citizenship is in heaven. Since the kingdom of God on earth is the church, we are to participate in the life of the church. We are commanded to assemble together every Lord's Day for worship, to be united in one Lord and one faith, to obey God's commandments, to repent whenever we sin, to hear the word of God read and preach, to partake of the sacraments, to pray for the church, for one another, and for our civil authorities, to use our spiritual gifts for the building up of the church, to guard the church from all false teachings, errors, and divisions, to live godly and holy lives, and to be witnesses to the unbelieving world by proclaiming the good news of salvation in Christ alone to the end. Let us pray. Almighty Lord, we give you thanks and praise for comforting us in the knowledge that you are with us, uh, with us in our earthly pilgrimage until we arrive in your heavenly city. Guide us and guard us from the temptations, cares, and desires in this barren land where ungodly sinners surround us and beset us from all sides. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.